Hello, everyone, and welcome to the virtual clinical update with Q&A. My name is Carrie Lynn Vox, and I am the Senior Manager of Chapter and State Relations for AORN. A link will be provided after this meeting to view and download the webinar if you are not able to stay with us for the entire session. 0.75 contact hours will be offered for this session, time permitting, unless we go over our scheduled 45 minutes. Evaluation instructions will be sent after the meeting. The outcomes are to identify instrument transportation and cleaning practice recommendations for known or suspected COVID-19 patients. Discuss FDA emergency use authorization as it applies to PPR pre-processing during the COVID-19 pandemic. Identify the pressure requirements for an OR when caring for a COVID-19 patient. Describe the time required for clearance of airborne contaminants from an OR. And discuss implementation strategies to reduce risk of environmental contamination and optimize use of personal protective equipment. All attendees have been muted. The session will be dedicated to questions we have received on our nursing consult line and previous webinar with time at the end for Q&A. To ask a question, please type it into the chat box at the bottom of your page. In the event we are not able to get to all of your questions, we will record the answers to add to our COVID-19 support page on AORN.org. I would now like to introduce Linda Grow, CEO and Executive Director. Linda? Thank you, Carrie Lynn. Welcome to our second COVID-19 clinical update and Q&A. We will present answers to your clinical questions on how to best manage your practice and the health and safety of yourselves and your patients. Before we get started, I'd like to review the many resources that AORN has developed to support you. You'll find on the AORN landing page the frequently asked questions with answers and recommendations provided by our perioperative nurse specialist. The page is updated daily to contain the most recent information available on COVID-19. We've classified the extensive content into eight categories. In order to help you find the information that you need, they are surgical precautions, PPE, transmission-based precautions, environmental cleaning, leadership, ASCs, converting ORs to an ICU, ventilators, and sterilization. There's also a toolkit that can be accessed from our homepage. It too is updated daily with the recommendations and guidelines that are provided by the organizations that are evaluating the coronavirus data and studies. These resources come primarily from the CDC, the World Health Organization, FDA, ASA, APIC, and ASPAN. Remember, too, to share your ideas and solutions with your peers on OR NurseLink. In the last two weeks, more than 3,000 of you have visited this site, and there are currently more than 20 discussion threads on the topic of COVID-19. Additionally, remember, AORN has extended the nursing consult line to four days a week, Monday through Thursday, from 9 a.m to 1 p.m. Mountain Time. On a related matter, you've seen several emails from us advising you of our Congress meetings. And as a result, we've received some feedback that our focus on COVID-19 communications was insufficient in comparison. Let me assure you, we are diligently working in your best interest. Our perioperative nurse specialists are working extended hours to evaluate, report, and recommend best practices when we're in a time where recommendations are changing daily. 
Even so, AORN must continue to manage the business of the association, and it was necessary to advise our members of our virtual Congress. We are incorporated in the state of New York, and this meeting was necessary according to the laws in that state to ensure that we would have a quorum in keeping with our bylaws. At the conclusion of our Q&A, we have a poll to ask you what else we can do to support you. Your participation and feedback are essential. Please take time to answer the questions. Now let's get started answering your questions tonight. Dr. Lisa Spruce, our Director of Evidence-Based Perioperative Practice, will moderate. Dr. Spruce? Thank you, Linda. Welcome, everyone. Our panelists tonight are Dr. Aaron Kyle, Byron Burlingame, and Dr. Julie Kahn. Aaron Kyle is Editor-in-Chief for the Guidelines for Perioperative Practice at ARN. She is lead author for the Guideline for Sterilization and the Guideline for Sterilization Packaging Systems. Erin collaborates with the nursing practice team to support AORN members with answers to clinical questions via the AORN consult line and through the clinical issues column in the AORN journal. She is a member of and serves as the staff liaison to Amy and ASTM, where she is active in national and international standards development. Byron Burlingame is a senior perioperative practice specialist. He has served in that role for 15 years. Byron is the lead author for various guidelines, including the guideline for design and maintenance of the surgical suite. Byron represents AORN on the Facility Guidelines Institute's Healthcare Guidelines Revision Committee and ASHRAE's OR Air Committee. Byron has authored several clinical issues columns and other articles published in AORN Journal and other professional publications. Prior to coming to AORN, Byron worked as a circulating RN and in various levels of management in large and rural hospitals. Dr. Julie Kahn has 16 years of experience in perioperative nursing. She has worked in eight operating rooms across the United States from Boston to Hawaii, giving her a well-rounded perspective of clinical practice. She completed an MSN as a clinical nurse specialist in 2007 and a doctorate in nursing practice in 2017. Much of her work has revolved around professional development of perioperative nurses and ensuring excellence in patient outcomes. Dr. Kahn has worked as a perioperative practice specialist for AORN since 2017 and was the lead author of the AORN guideline for sterile technique. Our entire nursing practice staff has called through the most frequently asked questions and categorized tonight's Q&A accordingly. We found the most FAQs fell into six categories. They are instrument handling and sterilization, reprocessing N95 respirators, time for contaminant clearance, positive or negative pressure, COVID-19 precautions and aerosol generation, and finally reducing OR and sterile field contamination. So now I'm gonna turn it over to Erin to get started. Thank you, Lisa, and thank you to everyone for joining us this evening. I'd like to start, next slide please. I'd like to start um, by covering, uh, letting you know what topics I'll be covering. I'll be answering some of the questions about instrument handling and reprocessing N95 respirators that have been submitted to AORN just recently. We'll start with instrument questions. If you can see the screen, you will see some of the questions that have been submitted. So tonight we'll be talking about how to manage the process of breaking down the sterile field after the case and balancing that with patient extub extubation, which is an aerosol generating procedure, which will be discussed later in this clinical update. We'll talk about how to manage instrument transport to the decontamination area, how instruments should be handled by decontamination personnel, and any special guidance regarding endoscope processing for a COVID positive patient. First, we'll answer these questions. Should instruments be pre-treated and remain in the room after the case for the entire time the room is closed to achieve 99% air exchange? What is the correct care and handling of instruments following a procedure? And how do we get them to central sterilization? 
The instruments may be pretreated and removed from the operating room prior to extubation or air, other aerosol generating procedure. If the instruments are removed after extubation or other aerosol generating procedure, they should be pretreated and remain in the room until 99% air exchange has occurred. The time it takes to achieve 99% air exchange is dependent upon the air exchange rate of your room, and Byron will be discussing how to use this information about air exchange rates and clearance later in this presentation. Once instruments are placed into a cart and the doors are closed, the outside of the cart should be wiped with its disinfectant prior to being sent to sterile processing. For open carts, these should be covered with a clean disposable cover for transport out of the operating room to the decontamination area. If the patient is waking up and about to be extubated before the instruments have been pretreated and removed from the room, personnel who are not wearing respiratory protection while serving the function of breaking down the field should leave the room during extubation and return only after 99% air exchange has occurred. It is critically important for the team in the room to be safe and protected as the highest priority. Next, the question, back one please. Can scrub supplies be immediately, be removed immediately following a procedure or is it preferred that they remain in the room for a minimum time? It is preferred for the sterile field to be broken down, pretreatment performed, and contaminated reusable instruments and devices removed from the operating room and transported to, to the decontamination area as soon as possible after the procedure. However, if the patient will be extubated before the instruments have been pretreated and removed, personnel who are serving that function should leave the room during extubation and wait for air exchanges to clear airborne contaminants before re-entry to the room and then follow the procedure that I mentioned previously. You heard me mention this on the previous slide. We are repeating it here because we want you to clearly understand that it is AORN's position that your safety and your team's safety are the highest priority. It is critically important for the team in the room to be safe and protected, and that is the highest priority. Now we'll answer some questions specific to the decontamination area. The first question is, how should instruments that have been used for a COVID positive patient be handled in the decontamination area? Surgical instruments that have been used for either COVID-19 or non-COVID-19 patients should be handled the same way as they have been handled before the pandemic. And personnel handling contaminated instruments should follow universal precautions. The SARS-CoV-2 virus is susceptible to EPA registered hospital disinfectants and the process is described in the AORN guideline for cleaning and care of surgical instruments, the guideline for sterilization, and in the ANSI Amy ST79 standard. All processing steps should strictly follow the manufacturer's instructions for use for the instrument, cleaning and disinfection solutions, and the decontamination and sterilization equipment. It is also essential that personnel who handle and decontaminate these instruments wear personal protective equipment consistent with the AORN guideline for cleaning and care of surgical instruments and organizational policies and procedures. This PPE includes a gown with fluid resistant sleeves, gloves, general purpose utility gloves with a cuff that extends beyond the cuff of the gown, a mask with validated fluid barrier protection, and you can look to the, to the box for the product for the ASTM rating that will tell you what that fluid barrier protection is. Eye protection or a full face shield, shoe covers or boots, which are designated for use as PPE. So here it does bear mentioning that while the recommendation to perform brushing only below the water line when hand washing instruments and devices is not a new recommendation, it is especially important now because brushing above the waterline can produce aerosols and the risk of these in the context of a COVID-19 is not known. Uh, the AORN guidelines are available free in the eGuidelines Plus format during this crisis. The links to guidelines are found on the AORN COVID-19 support page. 
Another question is, are there any instructions on cleaning the instruments by hand or in a tunnel washer? To answer that, instruments should be processed using existing protocols, which should be consistent with the instrument, enzymatic, detergent, and EPA registered hospital grade disinfectants, as well as the equipment and sterilizer manufacturer's instructions for use. You can refer to the AORN guidelines for cleaning and care of surgical instruments and ANSI Amy ST79 for more guidance. Next, we'll answer this question. Has there been any guidance regarding care and handling of rigid or flexible esophagoscopes used for COVID positive or suspected patients? In the same way as surgical instruments, these should be handled according to the manufacturer's instructions for use and in a manner that is consistent with the AORN guideline for flexible endoscopes. You may know that channeled flexible endoscopes are known to present unique decontamination challenges, and this has been an issue in the past several years. It is essential that endoscopes undergo, undergo point of use treatment and proper decontamination as soon as possible after use. This is true of all endoscopes, not just esophagoscopes. I know I've said this already, but I do want to repeat it. Look to the AORN COVID support page for links to the AORN guidelines, which are available free in electronic format during this crisis. Now we'll move on to questions about reprocessing N95 respirators. We have received questions about safety and effectiveness for the various N95 reprocessing methods that many institutions have been and are studying and what the FDA's role is in protecting healthcare workers who may decide to use a reprocessed respirator. This is a complex topic where risks weighed against benefits is an essential component of all decision-making. Our goal is to give you the information you need to fully understand the risks of reprocessing N95s so you and your team can make an informed decision. What you see on your screen is a list of resources that will be made available to you just as soon as possible after the, uh, after the end of this presentation uh, sometime tomorrow. I'll start with the question about the role of the FDA during this health crisis. The question is, we saw the FDA emergency use authorization for reprocessing masks and N95 respirators. What does e emergency use authorization mean in this situation? And how is that different than the usual FDA approval or clearance process? This is a complicated question, but one that is important to understand during this crisis. These resources you see on screen were used to construct an answer to this question. A United States Food and Drug Administration Emergency Youth Use Authorization, or EUA, declaration is used only in times of a public health emergency or threat to national security. More specifically, an EUA permits the FDA commissioner to authorize the use of an unapproved medical product or an unapproved use of an approved medical product during a declared emergency involving a heightened risk of attack on the public or US military forces or a significant potential to affect national security. This includes our current public health crisis in the face of the COVID-19 pandemic. During this time of crisis, like we're facing now, we have to make decisions about how to respond to clinical needs by carefully weighing the risks and benefits of all options. For example, in a perfect situation, there would be no supply shortages and every person who needed an N95 would have a fresh clean one every time they needed it. Unfortunately, that is not the situation we are in at this time in many places across the United States. So one example of a current EUA that the FDA has issued is to Battelle for re reprocessing single-use N95 respirators by using a vaporized hydrogen peroxide system, which was not previously FDA cleared. The process used by this system is a little different from the process used by hospital hosp hydrogen peroxide gas plasma systems. More information about this system and others as they are made available can be found on the FDA website at the third link on the screen titled FDA Emergency Use Authorizations. Check this resource frequently for updates 
because they, they happen often and it's updated often. We can expect additional emergency use authorizations or EUAs to be added in the coming days and weeks for other processes that could be helpful. For clinicians in the field, it is essential for you to understand that there will be many practices that will be introduced to deal with this crisis that are not part of the usual process, and each of these can carry risk. Only when you understand these risks can you carefully weigh them against the benefits. When any sterilizer manufacturer issues guidance on reprocessing disposable personal protective equipment, reach out to that sterilizer manufacturer for all information they have about the process as it was tested for safety and effectiveness, what the risks are, instructions for reprocessings, and limitations of the sterilization process, and the status of any applicable emergency use authorization. This is very important because the FDA can provide some assurance to us that they are reviewing these as they, come, as they, as they become available. So there are multiple ways that devices and processes may become available to you for PPE reprocessing. Remember that these are different and anything that falls outside the usual FDA clearance process should be carefully evaluated for risk before implementation. First, the usual process requires that the device manufacturer complete extensive validation studies, which can take months or years and is usually conducted by an independent laboratory. Using devices and processes that have undergone the FDA clearance process provides you some assurance that the risks and benefits have been considered, studied, and determined to be safe before the device or process hits the market. In times of emergency, you see the emergency use of eligible FDA approved, uh, uh, the emergency use authorization or EUA in the second bullet. In, in this case, the company submits an application for an EUA and must answer some specific questions about how their product or service helps during the emergency. So there is a guidance document that's referenced at the bottom of this slide. You can refer to pages 14 through 16 in that guidance document for more details about EUAs. Another way that an emergency measure can emerge is through what the FDA calls emergency use of eligible FDA approved medical countermeasures without an EUA. When this method is used to make a product or service available during an emergency, it does not require submission of, a st of any study data for its use and products that are used under this authority qualify for applicable PrEP application uh, PrEP Act protection. You can see page 30 of the same FDA guidance document referenced on this slide for more details about what that means. The next question around N95 reprocessing safety and effectiveness is, how do we know which methods are safe to use and supported by best evidence? What is the best method of single use mask and N95 decontamination? There are many institutions that are conducting studies of differing quality. We have heard about these and are not able to determine what is the best method of disinfection at this time. It is important to understand that disinfection without first cleaning is a concept that is outside of what we are used to. Understanding the effects of disinfection attempts to an item that cannot be effectively cleaned is not well understood. However, during this crisis, a disinfected N95 is likely better than no N95 at all. The CDC has recently released a comprehensive and reliable guidance for this topic titled Decontamination and Reuse of Filtering Face Piece Respirators Using Contingency and Crisis Capacity Strategies. And it is available on their website where you can find detailed guidance and tables that explain what is known about each decon decontamination strategy. So this statement of caution is found on the guidance webpage. CDC and NIOSH do not recommend that filtering face piece respirators, including N95, be decontaminated and then reused as a standard care. This practice would be inconsistent with their approved use, but we understand in times of crisis, this option may be needed to need to be considered when filtering face piece respirator shortages exists. The CDC guidance does state that vaporous hydrogen peroxide, ultraviolet, ultraviolet germicidal irradiation and moist heat are the most promising decontamination methods. If filtering face piece respirator decontamination is considered, these methods 
do not appear to break down the filtration or compromise the respirator. However, many of these methods can only be used for limited times. They go on to say that given the uncertainties of the impact of decontamination on respirator performance, these filtering face piece respirators should not be worn by healthcare providers when performing or present for an aerosol generating procedure. In addition to these CDC resources, the ECRI Institute recently released a clinical evidence assessment for safety of extended use and reuse of N95 respirators, which is a 26 page document with the intent to provide practical guidance on the potential risks and benefits that clinicians should consider during decision making about N95 use and reuse during this crisis. This document summarizes many of the studies that have been done and can be a great resource for you and your team as you navigate this issue. That link to the CDC guidance and ECRI report will be available on the AORN COVID toolkit in addition to these presentation materials. The last question that I have to answer on this topic is an important one, and it is, what are the risks to the wearer for wearing a reprocessed mask or N95? I'll give you some of the risks that are known. First, disinfection using chemical sterilants requires aeration before use to ensure that chemical sterilant residuals are not present on the mask when used. Fit may be altered by some disinfection methods. If the user receives a reprocessed respirator that someone else has worn, the fit could be altered. Not all N95s can be reprocessed using the same methods and the process could damage the materials. For example, PPE containing cellulose cannot be disinfected using hydrogen peroxide gas plasma. It is, a, it is difficult to determine how long a mask or N95 has been used after, after it has been reprocessed, so its effectiveness may be diminished when it is used again. Some manufacturers of single-use N95 masks have communicated they don't support attempts to decontaminate their products. And these reasons should be explored before implementing any reprocessing strategy. If the organization does not clearly define protocol that will be used for collection and redistrib redistribution, contaminated items may become mixed with those that have been disinfected. Damage to the respirator may occur and the filter may be compromised by disinfection attempts, render rendering the N95 ineffective. This is not a complete list and other issues may arise in the future, or they, there may be some that we haven't identified. This is not to say that your organization may not benefit uh, from using reprocessed N95s, and this benefit may actually outweigh the risks. But I will say it again, it is essential that you and your team understand the risks so you can mitigate them before implementing emergency measures like this in your organization. Now I'd like to turn it over to Byron Berlingame, Senior Perioper Perioperative Practice Specialist. Thanks, Aaron. In the OR, we all know how important time is to us. And I'm sure many of you are feeling like it is taking a lot more time to work around this little old COVID-19 virus. Well, you are correct. And it is not just you that is feeling that way. We have received multiple questions regarding times and I'm going to answer them essentially as a group. Here are some of the questions and there are several other very similar questions, but there's just not enough space to list them all. I will also, as Aaron did, advise you to go to the AORN COVID-19 FAQs for answers to these questions and others. In fact, the answers for today's questions will soon be posted to the website. When we talk about time, we are talking about how long it will take the air handling or HVAC system to clear all of the airborne contaminants, which in this case is COVID-19 out of the room. The amount of time it takes to clear the, care, clear the airborne contaminants is dependent on the number of air changes per hour. Shown here is the table that the CDC has provided for times to clear the air. Most ORs have, as shown at the bottom of the page, 
either 15 or 20 air changes per hour, but some have more. If you do not know the number of air changes per hour, contact your maintenance or plant operations department and ask them. They'll tell you. As you can see, the time required to reach 99% efficiency at 15 air changes per hour is 18 minutes. And for 99.9% .9 efficiency, it's 28 minutes. If the air changes per hour is set at 20, the time required for 99% efficiency is 14 minutes and 21 minutes for 99.9% .9 efficiency. More air changes per hour equals less time. Another way to say this is the time that the room needs to set before personnel can enter the room without wearing respiratory protection. And by the way, cleaning should not occur during this lag time while we're waiting for the air to be cleaned. In addition to the questions from tonight's presentation, a link to this table will also be available on the AORN COVID-19 page under the FAQs. The next group of questions I am responding to deal with positive or negative pressurized operating rooms. A few examples of the questions are, can we operate on a COVID-19 positive patient in an OR with positive pressure? Can surgical procedures be completed in an OR with negative pressure? Should a positive pressure OR be converted to a negative pressure room? And you know what? I'm gonna actually handle this last question first. Normally the direction of airflow in an operating room is from the operating room to the hallway, and this is known as positive pressure. The reason positive pressure is used is because it helps to minimize contamination of the surgical field. In some hospitals, there are ORs with reversible airflow or pressure switches, whereas others may have positive pressure rooms with a negative pressure anteroom. These rooms are usually used for patients who are in airborne isolation precautions and have a disease such as TB. If you are considering converting an OR to negative pressure, which by the way, is not advised to be done by the folks from ASHRAE, which is the American Society of Healthcare Refrigeration and Air Conditioning. They write the rules for these things like pressure. And if you are considering it, as I was starting to say, a risk assessment should be performed by an interdisciplinary team, including representatives from the OR, engineering, and the maintenance team. One thing these guy, people from maintenance can help you determine is whether altering the pressure to be negative in one or more ORs will have an effect on an air balancing in the adjacent areas. This is due to the fact, unknown to many OR personnel, that frequently the one air handling system actually provides the air to more than one operating room. So you gotta get your maintenance people into this. A positive pressure room may be used for a procedure on a COVID-19 positive patient when there is an increased risk for SSI or when converting the OR to negative pressure is not feasible. If possible, perform the procedure when the least amount of people are in the surgical suite. In other words, this is a risk versus benefit decision that will be specific to the situation, the patient's needs, and the proximity of other patients in other operating rooms. During the procedure, you should limit traffic and only open the door if it is absolutely necessary. And by the way, I'll be speaking a little more to doors here shortly. Something that helps in this situation is to have a runner outside the OR to secure supplies. And that person may wear a surgical mask, but should not enter the OR. If you have an anteroom or substerile room, this can be used to draw as a drop-off point but make sure that only one door is open at a time. 
Ideally, the patient should be intubated in a negative pressure room and then transferred to the positive pressure OR. Once the patient is intubated, they are considered low risk because it is a closed system. Also consider transferring the patient to a negative room for extubation. And when performing intubation and or extubation in a positive pressure OR, only essential personnel wearing respiratory protection, such as an N95 respirator or a PAPR, should be in the OR. And if you're unable to provide the entire team with respiratory protection, a time after completion of intubation should be established for when it is safe for other team members who do not have respiratory protection on to enter the room. Remember, the doors should not be opened after intubation or extubation until the time has lapsed for removal of the air contaminants as described in the previous question. That is also the same time that I was just mentioning. A portable anti-room system called the PASS slash HEPA combination unit may also be used. If you're not familiar, this is a unit that is available that sits outside the door and creates a negative pressure in a small area and it behaves just like an anteroom. This system actually cleans the air that comes out of the operating room before it reaches the semi-restricted hallway. Now let's discuss negative pressure rooms. It is true that procedures may be accomplished in negative pressure rooms, but it should only be done in situations in which the benefits outweigh the harms. The primary harm to consider is there may be an increased contamination of the surgical field from the contamination that will enter the OR from the hallway and from other contaminants within the room or in the air in general. If it is determined that an OR with negative pressure will be used for a surgical procedure, keep the doors to the OR closed and minimize traffic in and out of the room. Perform the procedure with the fewest possible people in the room. The same airborne precautions that are required for a positive pressure room should be taken even if the OR is a negative pressure room. After the procedure, leave the room vacant while the HVAC system clears any airborne contaminants that may remain in the room. Air exchanges that remove airborne contaminants should occur before anyone who is not wearing respiratory protection enters the room and before environmental cleaning is done. A person that I'm referring to here that is in a lot of the questions is the environmental services worker. When can they enter the room? And the time frame for this is the same time as I previously mentioned. Now we'll discuss doors. The key to this whole thing is to keep the door openings to a very minimum in both positive and negative pressure rooms. During the intubation and extubation process and for the number of minutes required for removal of contaminants after intubation or extubation, the door should remain closed at all times. If your OR has two doors, one leading to the core and one to the hallway, either door may be opened. But think about it from this aspect. Which door would provide the least amount of airflow disruption? And here's some examples. In some facilities, the door to the outer hallway is much larger than the door to the core or it may even be automated and remain open longer than the time required to manually close the door to the core. If either of these situations exist, the door to the core should be utilized, except when it is necessary to move the patient through the door. The door should only be opened as far as necessary to bring in supplies. Well, this actually ends my portion of today's presentation, and now Julie is going to take over. Good evening, everyone. Thanks for joining us. I am going to review 
the first, the COVID-19 precautions, and then aerosol generation. So we've received many questions about whether COVID-19 precautions should be used for all patients. And the answer is really more complicated than a yes or no. Ideally, screening of patients for symptoms and history of exposure to positive COVID-19 patients should occur before scheduling surgery. However, there have been concerns about lab testing in asymptomatic patients. So depending on your local situation and your patient population, it may be ideal to have everyone in the OR wear respiratory protection for all patients, regardless of COVID-19 status. But this is a decision that you should take into account not only your N95 supply at the present time, but also your projected usage as this shortage is expected to continue for months. The CDC only recommends N95 use for known or suspected COVID-19 patients and the use of N95 should be prioritized for these patients. During the town hall last week, and I even saw some coming through today, we received many questions about aerosol generating procedures. Now, to be clear, the CDC has identified specific aerosol generating procedures that are linked to the potential for transmission from respiratory droplets. Now, when performing these procedures, the CDC recommends that healthcare providers in the room wear respiratory protection, such as N95s. There is a known risk for potential transmission from smaller aerosolized respiratory droplets that may occur during aerosol, aerosol generating procedures. The risk of transmission from aerosolized blood and body fluids remains unknown at this time. And AORN has identified procedures that may occur during surgery that can aerosolize blood and body fluids. So out of an abundance of caution, AORN recommends taking precautions, including respiratory protection, to prevent transmission when aerosolized blood and body fluids may be present. So here on the screen, you can see the two different categories we were just discussing. According to the limited data from the CDC, COVID-19 has been detected in blood specimens, and it is unknown whether the virus is viable or infectious in extrapulmonary specimens, meaning specimens that come from outside the lungs. There have been some reports that COVID-19 is present in stool and may be transmissible through a fecal oral route. Bronchoscopy, tracheostomy, and thoracic cases may have a higher risk for airborne transmission of COVID-19 because of the nature of the procedures that involve the respiratory tract, which could lead to aerosolization of the virus. This next section talks about reducing OR and sterile field contamination. There have been several questions asked about removing unnecessary equipment and covering items in plastic. And one way to reduce the risk of transmission is through thoughtful and judicious preparation for the procedure with the removal of all items, including equipment and supplies that are not needed before the patient enters the room. Equipment, instruments, and supplies that are brought into the room for potential use later in the procedure may be contained in a plastic bag or plastic bin to reduce the potential for door opening and to minimize aerosolized particulates from settling on these items during the procedure. In their recommendation in on the care of COVID-19 patient, the American Society of Anesthesiologists, the ASA, suggests that it may be beneficial to utilize disposable covers like plastic sheets to reduce droplet and contact contamination of equipment and surfaces. When plastic is used, <clears throat> excuse me, it should either be cleaned and disinfected or changed in between patients because the SARS-CoV-2, the virus that causes COVID-19, can survive for up to three days on plastic and stainless steel. The AORN COVID-19 support page also contains a related frequently asked question for your review on how should operating rooms be decontaminated following surgery on a COVID-19 patient. There were two questions regarding the removal of items from cabinets or if sealing them shut was necessary. Taping off of cabinets or removing items from maybe another option to prevent healthcare personnel from entering cabinets. Entering cabinets with gloves may increase the potential to contaminate the items within the cabinet, but if cabinets are not entered, there is no additional cleaning required. If tape is used, careful attention to detail may be needed when it is removed to ensure that no tape residue remains on the walls or the cabinets. Tape residue may provide a reservoir for infectious material. We've received 
questions about whether procedures should be set up after intubation. As we discussed earlier, intubation is an aerosol, aerosol generating procedure and there may be a risk of aerosolized particles from intubation settling on the sterile field. However, the impact of aerosolized respiratory particles causing or contributing to surgical site infections in the same patient is unknown. So out of an abundance of caution, measures to prevent exposure of the sterile field to airborne contaminants should be used. Setting up a procedure after intubation may be one example of a precautionary measure that could be taken to prevent sterile field contamination up from aerosolized particles. This question and answer brings us to a related topic. Two questions were asked if tables should be covered after setup and during intubation. And the short answer here is yes. Table covering is another measure that has been shown to reduce contamination of sterile fields over time. The guideline for sterile technique recommends that sterile fields should be covered if not used immediately or during periods of increased activity. One period of increased activity identified in the literature is the time prior to incision, which includes intubation. There are two recommended methods for table covering that you can see on the screen. One is the two cuff drape method using two sterile drapes and the second is use of a sterile drape designed for table covering. When using a drape made for covering tables, follow the manufacturer's written instructions for use. The next section is going to discuss PPE. There are at least five questions on the use of powered air purifying respirators or PAPRs in the OR. Most of these questions had to do with the potential for air contamination on, in the sterile field when, when they're in the OR when sterile fields are present. It's important to understand that N95s and PAPRs are both considered respiratory protection or respirators. When the sterile field is present, an N95 is preferred to reduce the risk of contamination of the sterile field because there is exhausted, unfiltered air from PAPRs. Additionally, the external belt mounted blower and tubing is designed to be worn on the outside of the gown, which would contaminate a sterile gown and may increase the risk for surgical site infection. However, when an N95 is unavailable, a PAPR may be worn, but precautions should be taken to prevent contamination to the sterile field. Now, when a PAPR is worn, some measures that could be implemented to reduce the risk of sterile field contamination may include covering portions of the sterile field and directing PAPR blower exhaust away from the sterile field. On the screen, you can see the two different two of the different types of PAPRs available. There is some confusion with the CAPR. A capper is a papper from a specific company. It's the brand name of their papper, not a different device. Four questions were asked about the use of hoods when caring for COVID-19 patients. And it can be easy to confuse PAPRs and surgical helmet systems because they look similar. Surgical helmet systems, commonly referred to as hoods and togas, are typically worn in orthopedic procedures. And surgical helmet systems are a type of PPE that protects personnel from splash, splatters, or sprays. But these devices are not certified for respiratory protection. Conversely, PAPRs are certified as respiratory protection from airborne disease. The use of a surgical helmet system may be beneficial in care for a COVID-19 patient during procedures where there's an anticipated risk of splash spotter sprays, such as the use of high-speed powered equipment like drills or saws and debris de devices with irrigation like hydrosurgery, pulsatile lavage, or low-frequency ultrasonic debridement. Review the manufacturer's instructions for use. Many surgical helmet systems currently on the market do not require masks under the device, unlike in this picture. Therefore, the use of the N95 respirator under a surgical helmet system In COVID-19 patients, the sterile hood or toga may need to be done prior to entering the OR suite or in an ante room. Make sure to turn the fan on after the glove on. In a situation where there is no PPE available, a hood may provide some protection due to the positive pressure ventilation inside the device, although the incoming air may I believe Julie is having a little technological difficulty, so I'll uh, uh, step in and give her a hand here. 
There has been many questions in social media posts about making masks out of instrument wrap. As with all homemade masks, this is a last resort strategy, meaning that you have absolutely no mask available to you. Masks approved by the FDA have rigorous testing methods that cannot be duplicated in the clinical setting. It is unknown whether masks made of sterilization wrap provide any protection as PPE. Using a mask made of sterilization wrap may provide a false reassurance of protection. While sterilization wrap may provide a higher level of bacterial filtration and fluid resistant than cloth masks, it is unknown whether this would provide any protection when worn as a mask. This strategy may also place the healthcare practitioner at risk for acquiring airborne contact droplet and bloodborne transmissible infections such as COVID-19. Use of homemade masks may also increase the patient's risk for surgical site infection when performed in an operating room. The AORN COVID support page includes a frequently asked questions titled, we have a shortage of surgical mask and or respiratory protection. What do we do? Which also includes, which also may help guide mask selection strategies based on the supply shortages at your facility. Byron, thank you. No problem. <laughs> Sorry about the technical difficulty there for a second. All right, there are two questions concerning the sequence for donning gloves and gowns when caring for a COVID-19 patient. The sequence for donning and doffing of PPE for both scrubbed and unscrubbed personnel for a COVID-19 patient has not changed. The CDC recommends donning one set of gloves for unscrubbed personnel according to that reference um, website you see below. However, if a facility determines that they would like to implement the use of double gloving of unsterile gloves for unscrubbed personnel, they should consult with their infection prevention team to determine a protocol and availability of resources to perform double gloving of unscrubbed personnel. We always recommend double gloving for scrubbed personnel. The link on the screen to the CDC can be found in the COVID-19 resources page in the frequently asked question, where should donning and doffing of PPE occur? All right, there were four questions asked about the type of PPE that runners should use. Runners should wear a surgical mask and should not enter the OR. And if you have an anteroom or substerile room, this can be used as a drop-off point, as Byron mentioned earlier, making sure one door is closed and the other is, is open making sure one door is closed before the other is open. All and right. These are, oh, go ahead, Julie. Sorry. All right. These two next slides are just supporting references for that you can find on the support. Okay. Thank you so much to our panelists. But unfortunately, our time is almost over tonight. So now we're going to post the polling questions and give you a few seconds to answer them before we provide you more information and the date and time of our next Q&A clinical update. So I'm just gonna give you a few minutes to answer these questions. Okay, I hope everybody had time to complete their poll and thank you for completing it. Please take advantage of the many resources on the AORN website and please join us next Thursday at 6 p.m. for the next clinical update. And we're gonna be answering the questions that you have provided us tonight, as well as those that came in to us over OR Nurse Link and on our consult line. Additionally, the recording of this presentation will be added to our online COVID-19 support section tomorrow. And I thank you so much for joining us. Have a great evening and our clinical um, update is now concluded.